Good evening and welcome to the Four Lakes Church of Christ meeting in Madison, Wisconsin. We are so glad to have you with us tonight for our Wednesday evening Bible study. Tonight we are continuing in our fairly new study of the book of Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And we are hopefully covering Leviticus chapters 16 and 17 tonight. So we want to invite you to be finding a Bible and turning with us to Leviticus chapter 16. We'll be there in just a few moments. As always, if you have any questions or comments about tonight's class, <clears throat> if you have something that we need to be praying about as a church, we want to invite you to get in touch. Send me a message to info at fourlakeschurch.org. You can also call or send a text to 608-224-0274. But as I said, tonight we are getting back to our fairly new study of Leviticus. And a major theme in this book is holiness. That is being separate or different, set apart from the world around us. And we've learned that Leviticus is basically a handbook or a manual for the priesthood, for those who were responsible for helping the people maintain this holiness before the Lord. In chapters 1 through 7, we had an overview of the five major kinds of sacrifices that were offered. In chapters 8 through 10, we had the consecration of Aaron and his sons as priests. We had the first sacrifices. And then we had the first tragedy as Aaron's sons, Nadab and Abihu, are actually killed there on the spot for offering unauthorized fire before the Lord. And then last week in chapters 11 through 15, we had a summary of what is clean and what is unclean under God's law. And in this section, we had some revolutionary guidelines for controlling an outbreak of disease within a huge group of people. <clears throat> Number one. The disease had to be properly diagnosed. Secondly, those who were infected had to be quarantined. And then finally, the area where that person lived and anything he or she touched had to be completely destroyed or sanitized. And God, of course, gave these uh, guidelines uh, thousands of years before we would ever understand anything about germs or microbiology or anything about how an illness like that might spread. Well, tonight we come to God's instructions concerning what would be the most important holy day in the yearly calendar, and this is the Day of Atonement. So let's jump into it and start tonight with an overview of the Day of Atonement. This is Leviticus 16, verses 1 through 10. Leviticus chapter 16, verses 1 through 10. Now the Lord spoke to Moses after the death of the two sons of Aaron when they had approached the presence of the Lord and died. The Lord said to Moses, Tell your brother Aaron that he shall not enter at any time into the holy place inside the veil before the mercy seat which is on the ark, or he will die. For I will appear in the cloud over the mercy seat. Aaron shall enter the holy place with this, with a bull for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. He shall put on the holy linen tunic, and the linen undergarment shall be next to his body. And he shall be girded with the linen sash and attired with the linen turban. These are holy garments. Then he shall bathe his body in water and put them on. He shall take from the congregation of the sons of Israel two male goats for a sin offering and one ram for a burnt offering. Then Aaron shall offer the bull for the sin offering which is for himself, that he may make atonement for himself and for his household. He shall take the two goats and present them before the Lord at the doorway of the tent of meeting. Aaron shall cast lots for the two goats, one lot for the Lord and the other lot for the scapegoat. Then Aaron shall offer the goat on which the lot for the Lord fell, and make it a sin offering. But the goat on which the lot for the scapegoat fell shall be presented alive before the Lord to make atonement upon it, to send it into the wilderness as the scapegoat. Well, notice we start with a warning up there in verse 1, and this comes right after the deaths of Nadab and Abihu. So in this warning, God tells Aaron, do not go behind the veil into the most holy place before the mercy seat which was basically the lid or the uh, top there on top of the Ark of the Covenant. However, there is one exception to this ban on entering the most holy place, and it would happen one time every year. And we'll get to the timing of this a little bit later on in this chapter. But notice, to enter the most holy place, Aaron will need to offer first a bull for his own sin. And he'll need to offer a ram as a burnt offering. He'll need to take a bath, uh, washing himself. He'll need to change into those holy garments. And then he'll need to take two goats from the people, one as a burnt offering and then one as a sin offering. However, instead of offering both goats on the altar, notice he is to cast lots. 
I think today we would say he is to roll the dice or to draw straws or something to that effect. Flip a coin, we might say today. And then based on the result of casting those lots, one goat gets offered as a sin offering. And then notice the other goat is to symbolically take on the sins of the people and then be sent out into the wilderness as a scapegoat. And this is where we are introduced to the concept of a scapegoat in Scripture. And I think even today, sometimes people will refer to somebody being a scapegoat. And I, I hope that you have heard that at some point in your life outside the Lord's Church. But what do they mean by that when you say somebody's a scapegoat? Well, basically, somebody is a scapegoat who takes the blame. So say if something goes wrong at work, things may be better for the group if we can blame it on that guy. And it's that guy's fault. And so when somebody else takes the blame, the others may get off without taking the punishment. And whether people realize it or not, uh, this actually goes all the way back to the book of Leviticus. That is the first reference to a scapegoat. And that continues on even today. This is the first of two paintings of the scapegoat by British artist William Holman Hunt. And he painted this back in the mid-1850s, and so as we were having a civil war over here, he was over there, and he actually traveled to the Bible lands for the purpose of painting, and painted this somewhere near where Sodom would have been, near the southern edge of the Dead Sea. And I hope you can notice that he has included the red cloth that would have been tied around the animal's horns up there, and notice that is, I guess, to indicate that this is the scapegoat. And I don't think we're told that, at least in this passage, of scripture, but I hope we appreciate that little detail. And what I mean by that is, if I get hungry out in the wilderness and I get hungry enough to go kill a goat, I'm kind of hoping I wouldn't eat the one that's bearing the sins of two to three million people. But this is their custom, apparently, to mark that goat. So this goat was on a mission. And we won't read the whole chapter as we've already read the instructions. The rest of this chapter is basically a record of Aaron doing what he was just been told to do. But in Leviticus 16, 21 and 22, Aaron is to lay both hands on the head of the goat and confess over this goat all of the wickedness and the rebellion of the Israelites, all their sins. And he is to put those sins on the goat's head. And then God says, he shall send the goat away into the desert in the care of a man appointed for the task. And that goat will carry on itself all their sins to a solitary place. And the man shall release it in the desert. So I thought that was a very interesting painting here. Notice on the far left side of your screen, if you could see that, there's kind of some horns sticking up out of the sand or out of the dirt. And it looks like some kind of a skeleton carcass over there on the right side. And so maybe the remains of scapegoats from the past. Uh, but apparently William Hunt made two versions of this painting. So try to remember this one, kind of like freeze that in your mind. And then we'll go over to the other version. <clears throat> And notice this one is a little bit different, isn't it? It's, it's similar, but it's different. This one includes a rainbow. And, you know, why, would, why might the artist have included a rainbow in a, in a depiction of the scapegoat? Well, if you remember, the rainbow was God's reminder that he would never destroy the earth by water again. Fire next time, but not water. And so the rainbow then is kind of a symbol of God's mercy. And I would say so also with the scapegoat. And I think maybe for that reason, Mr. Hunt included that in this painting. And then also notice you've got kind of a little more of the, uh, the horns and a little bit of a head or a skull sticking out on the left side of the painting and then kind of the uh, uh, carcass over there on the, uh, on the far right at the, uh, at the base of the rainbow. Not a pot of gold, but a, a goat carcass there under the rainbow. Uh, but the concept is this goat it receives on its head the sins, the guilt all, of all of the rebellion of the entire nation. And it is sent off. You know, give it a smack on the backside or whatever it is. Get the goat out of there. And he just goes and he's sent off to wander in the wilderness for the rest of its life. Now, obviously, those of us who are Christians uh, see, I think, some rather straightforward comparison between Jesus and this scapegoat, just as the scapegoat took on the sins of the people. Uh, so also Jesus has taken on our sin and so on. And I know we can make a number of other comparisons, but the scripture really uh, doesn't go much beyond this. I just, I think it's safe to say that we do see some comparisons. Uh, before we leave this chapter, let's continue with the paragraph right near the end of it. So we're kind of fast forwarding here, going down to Leviticus 16. And let's look at chapter 16, verses 29 through 34. Leviticus 16, 29 through 34. This shall be a permanent statute for you. In the seventh month, on the tenth day of the month, you shall humble your souls and not do any work. 
whether the native or the alien who sojourns among you, for it is on this day that atonement shall be made for you to cleanse you. You will be clean from all your sins before the Lord. It is to be a Sabbath of solemn rest for you, that you may humble your souls. It is a permanent statute. So the priest who is anointed and ordained to serve as priest in his father's place shall make atonement. He shall thus put on the linen garments, the holy garments, and make atonement for the holy sanctuary, and he shall make atonement for the tent of meeting and for the altar. He shall also make atonement for the priests and for all the people of the assembly. Now you shall have this as a permanent statute to make atonement for the sons of Israel for all their sins once every year. And just as the Lord had commanded Moses, so he did. Well, here we find that this sacrifice is not just a one-time sacrifice. This is to be an annual tradition. And it is to take place on the 10th day of the 7th month. This year, by the way, the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, as it is known today, it will take place on October 11th. That is the evening of October 11th through sunset on October 12th. Without the temple, the Jewish people obviously don't do the sacrifices. They don't do the scapegoat anymore. Uh, but they do honor this day in some way. But that's when it is on our calendar, October 11th this year. Notice in verse 29 how God wants them to humble your souls before the Lord, not do any work. Later tradition interpreted this to be a reference to fasting, that is, abstaining from food. And we plan on studying fasting this Sunday, if the Lord wills, in the uh, Sermon on the Mount. However, as far as I can tell, fasting is never commanded in the law itself. This is as close as we get to a command to fast. And it really doesn't say to fast, does it? In later years, when they took on the practice of fasting, they abused it. And we'll look at some of those abuses this coming Lord's Day. And God had to regulate that practice to, to keep it from being abused any further. But he never actually commanded fasting, unless we interpret this statement as a command to fast, which is kind of up in the air. But as far as I know, God never said in the actual law of Moses, to please me, you are not to eat any food from sundown today until sundown tomorrow. As far as I can tell, that is not found in God's law as it was delivered to Moses. Well, let's continue with Leviticus 17. We'll look at one more chapter tonight. These two kind of go together, and 17 is pretty different from 18 through 20, so we'll, we'll cover that. We'll throw this one in here. Leviticus 17, 1 through 9. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, <clears throat> Speak to Aaron and to his sons and to all the sons of Israel, and say to them, This is what the Lord has commanded, saying, any man from the house of Israel who slaughters an ox or a lamb or a goat in the camp, or who slaughters it outside the camp, and has not brought it to the doorway of the tent of meeting to present it as an offering to the Lord before the tabernacle of the Lord, blood guiltiness is to be reckoned to that man. He has shed blood, and that man shall be cut off from among his people. The reason is so that the sons of Israel may bring their sacrifices, which they were sacrificing in the open field, that they may bring them into the Lord <clears throat> at the doorway of the tent of meeting to the priest and sacrifice them as sacrifices of peace offerings to the Lord. The priest shall sprinkle the blood on the altar of the Lord at the doorway of the tent of meeting and offer up the fat and smoke as a soothing aroma to the Lord. They shall no longer sacrifice their sacrifices to the goat demons with which they play the harlot. This shall be a permanent statute to them throughout their generations. Then you shall say to them, any man from the house of Israel or from the aliens who sojourn among them, who offers a burnt offering or sacrifice and does not bring it to the doorway of the tent of meeting to offer it to the Lord, that man also shall be cut off from his people. What I hope we notice here is that God is prohibiting anybody from sacrificing on their own. As I see it, and as it seems from the context, this is a ban on um, do-it-yourself type sacrifices. So in other words, if you want to plan on sacrificing an animal to the Lord, you have to bring it to the tent of meeting to be presented before the Lord in the presence of the priest. <clears throat> and again, there may be uh, multiple reasons for this. He explains some of it explicitly here. Um, so let me know what you think about this. But I see this as a way of, number one, making sure the sacrifices are done properly. Remember, the priests are those who are trained to do this. Secondly, making sure that the priests are cared for by getting their cut of the sacrifice. This is a part of the law. 
Thirdly, encouraging fellowship, being a part of the group. These people are not to home church themselves. They're not to just be out there on their own uh, offering stuff to the Lord. This is something that they were supposed to do together. And then also, this would be a way to prevent the people from drifting off into the worship of the local gods. Uh, with a group, they were more accountable. And that seems to be the main thrust of this paragraph here. And this is actually mentioned specifically in verse number 7. And so as I see it, this is not random, but uh, God most likely has some very practical reasons for requiring that the people offer their sacrifices at the doorway of the tent of meeting. You know, if I'm sacrificing to some goat demon in my backyard and somebody calls me on it, I can't say, oh, I was actually, I was just offering this to the Lord. You know, I can't offer that, that excuse because if I'm sacrificing it to the Lord, I should have been in the temple. That's what the law says. So I think he kind of takes away that excuse and uh, makes sure that the sacrifices have to be uh, offered through the proper channels. Well, let's wrap it up tonight with one more paragraph. This is Leviticus 17, verses 10 through 16. Leviticus 17, 10 through 16. And any man <clears throat> from the house of Israel or from the aliens who sojourn among them, who eats any blood. I will set my face against that person who eats blood and will cut him off from among his people. For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you on the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood by reason of the life that makes atonement. Therefore I said to the sons of Israel, no person among you may eat blood, nor may any alien who sojourns among you eat blood. So when any man from the sons of Israel or from the aliens who sojourn among them in hunting catches a beast or a bird which may be eaten, he shall pour out its blood and cover it with earth. For as for the life of all flesh, its blood is identified with its life. Therefore, I said to the sons of Israel, you are not to eat the blood of any flesh, for the life of all flesh is its blood. Whoever eats it shall be cut off. When any person eats an animal which dies or is torn by beast, whether he is a native or an alien, he shall wash his clothes and bathe in water and remain unclean until evening, then he will become clean. But if he does not wash them or bathe his body, then he shall bear his guilt. Here in this passage, we have a reminder that the people are not to eat any blood. And the reason is the life is in the blood. And of course, today we know this. As I understand it, blood is important for a number of reasons, isn't it? It supplies oxygen throughout the body. It delivers nutrients. It uh, removes waste. It aids in healing. It coagulates. It helps the body repair itself. It helps to regulate pH and body temperature. I mean, blood is absolutely critical. And we do, I think, have some uh, imitation or fake blood, but it is nowhere near the real thing. It is so important that people donate blood. Uh, blood is really, really hard to replace. And so here, recognizing that life is in the blood, God outlaws eating blood. And there's been some speculation done that the pagans would drink blood in some of their rituals. And this may be one more reason for the ban on consuming blood. Uh, but here the reason is simply life is in the blood. And so even when they were out hunting, if they killed an animal outside of a sacrifice, the blood, it had to be drained from the, from the body out there in the field. That blood is to be buried. It is to be treated with respect because that is the life of that animal. The notice in the last paragraph, God also says that if an animal dies on its own or is partially eaten by another animal, that is not okay because the blood has not been properly drained. It hasn't been treated properly. <clears throat> and anybody who eats such an animal is to wash himself and must uh, be unclean for the rest of the day, I think it is. And this, of course, is pointing toward Jesus. He will shed his blood for us as a substitute. So blood is extremely important in God's plan, and this is part of it. Uh, he's taught this before, uh, but he is repeating this now as a part of the law of Moses for these people as they get ready to wander in the wilderness. So this brings us to the end of our fourth lesson, I believe, from the book of Leviticus. We've studied now the first 17 chapters. We are moving through this book rather quickly. I told you as we ended Exodus and moved into Leviticus that we would be picking up the pace. I think I've kept my word on that, uh, 17 chapters in four weeks. And I, we're not missing a whole lot. We're, we're hitting the highlights. And uh, feel free to read all of it on your own, of course. But uh, next week, we hope to look forward uh, to some uh, laws and on moral issues and uh, uh, dealing with relationships between people. This is Leviticus 18 through 20. So we'll deal with that next week if the Lord wills. As always, thank you so much for being with us tonight. I know it's been a, a sacrifice of your time to take time out of, a, of the week that we're having. 
As always, if there's something we need to be praying about, if there's any way we can help as a congregation, if we can encourage you, uh, we want to invite you to reach out. You can send an email to me, info at fourlakeschurch.org. You can also give me a call or send a text to 608-224-0274. As we close tonight, let's all go to God in prayer together. Our Father in heaven, you alone are truly holy and separate, and we come to you tonight as your people at your invitation. Thank you, Father, for hearing our prayer, and tonight we're thankful for your law given through the prophet Moses, and we're thankful tonight to be able to learn something and to be reminded about the importance of blood. Thank you for sending your Son for us to offer himself as a blood sacrifice, pouring out his blood for us on the cross as a substitute for us. Thank you, Father, for loving us. We love you, and we come to you in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen.